Max Lucado. So I was curious if he was another one of these super celebrity multi-millionaire pastors slash authors. Uh, and sure enough, absolutely. Max Lucado, according to CelebrityNetWorth.com, the richest celebrities, authors, et cetera, et cetera. These are the people that Satan gives the most money to to support his goals, which are always going to be in conflict with Christ's goals. In fact, if you look at the early church, you didn't have no wealthy superstar pastors. Uh, that's not to say that there weren't some people that had some money and means. You can read about them in scripture. And those people lovingly shared that money uh, as they as they chose to and uh, supported the, the gospel. But what you have now in America is this very strange upper echelon of Masons who are spread all throughout the church leadership. They're in uh, television, they're in movies, they're in the government. They're, it's a seven mountain mandate. They're in all its spheres of influence because that's how Satan rolls. That's how he works. And it's all about influencing people away from the actual gospel and giving them anything else that even remotely looks like it without it actually being the gospel. So the people that he, Luke 4 and Matthew 4, supports with these huge amounts of money and these lucrative contracts for writing books, and <coughs> this guy uh, specifically, his name being pushed in PR uh, ca campaign, uh, put through media. Everybody knows his name. He has a layer of fame to him as a pastor. Is pretty strange when you consider the New Testament and you consider that, you know, Jesus said, take up your cross. And there's a lot that could be said about that. But I think about how if people really legitimately give the true gospel, Satan has the purse strings in terms of this temporal existence. And Peter tells us that you will be persecuted for your faith if you live a, a, a life of, of godliness. And in Satan's rule, those who give the actual gospel, that's denting in his kingdom. He doesn't like that. And so he will make your life most unpleasant. And he uh, can certainly create a dependence that you have on God when you are constantly uh, being strangled under a noose of him withholding uh, monies from you and giving it to these types of turncoats. And again, they will give you something that looks a lot like the gospel, but it's not the actual gospel. So, okay. So uh, looking at this, his net worth as a pastor, remember all the apostles except for John were murdered, but he is an American Christian author, writer, and preacher who has earned a net worth of $10 million. <laughs> so that's pretty interesting to me that there's just this handful of, of superstar pastors. And of course they laud him with these, you know, titles, America's pastor. I thought they gave that past, uh, that uh, title to uh, Rick Warren, who I was affectionately <laughs> refer to as the devil in a Hawaiian shirt. You know, he's a little, a little fluffy and he always wears those Hawaiian shirts and uh, he capitulates on the gospel like, like nobody's business. Um, and I can't help but notice that um, this, Hand on the chin pose. If you go study that out, that appears to be a Masonic pose. They have this whole, you know, litany of language that they use. Symbols are a language. It's not. It's a non-linguistic language. And uh, oh, I hate Christianity today because this represents the whole liberal left-leaning side of fake Christianity. But there's also a whole um, right blue side of fake Christianity with NAR. So they, they have both sides, both sides. Um, this was an article written quite some time ago, and this would, of course, puff him and push him and encourage book sales. And, you know, of course, you know, if 
if you write to a wider audience of people who are not the born again Christian, which is the few on the narrow road and you're writing to the audience on the broad road, you're going to sell more books. So these are bought men. These are millionaire pastors. So they give them these titles, America's pastor. And wow. He's written quite a few books. They call him a missionary. That is such a bastardization of the truth that you would have people who are Masons, who are turncoats, who don't give the actual gospel, and then to call them a non-celebrity pastor. Uh-huh. Wink, wink. $10 million later. Uh, and, and call them a, uh, a missionary. Wow. <clears throat> I have I have tried to read one of his books, but I never really got into it. But uh, there they are pushing him. And he he's written a whole bunch of books. So I was. Looking into a little bit more of this interview, it's a very long interview <coughs> that uh, Max Lucado did with Jen Hatmaker over at jenhatmaker.com. And we found out from another video, we did a very, very long video, so this will be a sh hopefully a shorter video for those that don't quite have all that time. Or maybe if you are watching the longer video, you can pause it as you have an opportunity. But anyhow, he uh, uses some language that is so reminiscent of this, you know, everybody needs to come into consensus through, through this false unity. And he just plays all these little word games. Max says that our inability to work together, to communicate, to love one another, which means agree with and don't uh, don't don't show any concern for evil that anybody else is doing. You just keep it yourself. He says that that would be loving one another and that we need to model this for others. And he says that if we don't do that, well, we're paying a price for it. We're going to pay a price for it if we don't all get into the false unity that is represented by Rome and uh, Masons and other social engineers that want to draw you in underneath a fake coming Antichrist uh, who's an imposter of Jesus Christ. So Jen says, that's right. And then Max says, but it's not too late. And he repeats everything because he's brainwashing uh, those who will take that. It's not too late. And if we can come together and realize that what is at its core is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and then let everything else be of secondary importance and learn the beauty of disagreeing agreeably. So what he's saying is that he believes that there is a death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's kind of in this universalistic, you don't have to repent, you don't have to do anything, it's just done. It's done for you. Keep buying my books. Keep, keep uh, letting me lull you into a false sense of security through through a, a ecumenical unity group salvation kind of a thing. And Jen says, uh, you know, that's good. But uh, he also doesn't want you to disagree with her uh, and say that abortion is wrong and we need to stop this. And of course, that whole side that perpetuates that evil of infanticide for money, uh, which is a huge thing for those that worship that God of money. Uh, he doesn't want you to criticize her. He, he says that it's of secondary importance. <clears throat> and he also doesn't want you to say that if you, if you, if you don't repent, so if you want to stay uh, in any type of sin up to and including the Rainbow Mafia, um, she wants you to believe that that's okay. God is just copacetic with that. They have a different God who doesn't care. He's not a real God. It's, it's Lucifer a light bearer playing games, but they're trying to draw all these weak people into this false unity, which is why he uses this language. And there's the, the little threat attached to it. Well, we're paying a price for it. 
<clears throat> and then Max says, "Then there uh, been a one a wonderful movement, like a wonderful deception. Then a wonderful movement can break out." <laughs> So we're going to do something different now, especially through the media, because, you know, we haven't had TV for that long in comparison to uh, since 33 AD. Obviously, there's been uh, just very, very few years in comparison that we've had this platform through all the social media to uh, extend out the message of brainwashing through people's devices and the technology where we are now. But uh, we should be doing something different now, utilizing this mass media deception for this lie that we didn't have access to before. So the church that was holding firm against evil and teaching people the truth and giving them the gospel, we, we, we don't need to worry about that. We need to worry about capitulating now. Yeah. And then Max says, but as long as we're picking at each other, you can't can't pick at each other. So Jen totally thinks it's fine to have sons and daughters covered in blood, murdered for money. And if you tell her that's wrong, you're you're picking at her. You stop picking at her. As long as we're doubling up our fists, you are doubling up your fists. And as long as we're speaking out about one another in a way, hey, that doesn't honor God. God must be like us and must be like these heathen that are probably getting a kickback from the abortion industry for promoting their industry. So Jen pushes this and he wants you to think that God is totally fine with, you know, hacking little babies into pieces. That's fine. What's wrong with you? But what God is not going to honor, Max would tell you, is if you are speaking out about this evil these people are doing and you're not holding hands with them in agreement. How does that not sound like the devil of hell pretending to be the false god? And yet you've got America's pastor, 2004, Christianity Today said so. And he's saying that the problem here is you're not being nice. When we want to hack babies to pieces, you keep telling us it's wrong. <laughs> Doesn't Jesus himself say, Woe to those who harm a hair, harm a hair on the head of one of these little ones? And doesn't the Ten Commandments say that it's wrong to commit murder? Yeah, but they're going by the God of this world. I think you mixed a couple scriptures together, but that's okay because he considers babies very precious and, uh, <laughs> uh he hates when children are messed with, but you know, if, if you, uh, if you want to be part of that other church, that's mean. Mention the whole, gosh, <laughs> not chill. Yeah. The sixth command. I mean, it's just a Ten commandment. It's nothing important. Just an allegory. Yeah. So she, uh, she agrees with yes. And then Max says, well, nobody wants to, I mean, who wants to join a table where everybody's squabbling? You're all just squabbling. You are going to keep unbelievers from wanting to join our little club. That's insane. And then she agrees, sure. And he says, so this is a big deal. So this false unity that, that people from Rome, Babylon, Mason, Babylon, Israel, and unbelief, Babylon, the rebellion of Babylon. What they really want you to do is to join into this unity and to quit calling sin, sin, because you're going to make people feel bad. And then when you make people feel bad, you're going to make God mad. <clears throat> so this is a big deal, Max says. She agrees. And Max says, in fact, if I could just add real quickly, she says, please. When it, <laughs> Max says, when it comes to unbelievers, we can be respectful. We do not have the right to be arrogant and point a finger. And of all the people who should not be arrogant, it is those of us who believe we are saved by grace. So when Paul tells you, to repent and be born again when he when Jesus tells you 
to not murder when the Bible tells you to stay out of sexual immorality, especially homosexuality, all of those things set down by the Bible. You don't need to worry about that because Jen and Max, A, they want you to remember you don't have a right to be arrogant and point a finger and say that's evil. You're going to make God mad. Well, what's worse? Telling somebody the truth and hurting their feelings for a short while or sitting on your butt not doing what Jesus tells you to do and spreading the gospel and telling the truth and letting someone die in hell. Yeah, but they, they're, they're, they're not even going to talk about hell. They, I, my, my suspicion is they don't believe that there is a hell. And they don't, I, my suspicion is that they are universalists and that uh, Paul, uh, the, the, the Shack author, I, his name slips me at the moment, but um, anyhow, the author of The Shack, and then they did a movie too. He really put a wedge in to William erase. Paul Young. Yeah, William Paul Young, thank you. Uh, to erase in a lot of people's minds, you know, who and what God is, that there's no hell. He doesn't want there to be a hell. So, I mean, when people full heartedly embraced his weirdo, he, she, Kabbalist, island, mama, uh, whatever that thing is, that people said it changed the way I viewed God. Well, I'm sure it did. That was the point. Um <clears throat> And then he wrote further books and then Bethel uh, ha had interviews and they 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 pushed that thing. And when people endorsed that and went, yeah, that looks like the truth to me, he did a lot of groundwork. So, I mean, this is easy now for Jen and Max, uh, multimillionaires. I bet she's a millionaireist too, I'm willing to bet you. They can come along now and... And say whatever they want and be on this. Hold on a second. Be on this mission to bring about this false unity. Well, that's not helpful. <laughs> it's somewhere between 100,000 and 1 million, but we don't know. There's a lot of numbers in between that. <laughs> <laughs> but they they uh, seeded her into the Christian community through through uh, her HGTV documentary series, My Big Family Renovation, and her husband Brandon. They're Christians, don't you know? They're all Christians. Uh, so we'll see if we can get any Lucifer other. Lucifer himself is a Christian. I heard the <laughs> Yeah. There's a rumor going around. Yep. Lucifer loves loves him some Christianity, just not the real one. Heh. Well, a uh, celebrity tr uh, trending now puts her at a hundred and twenty-four million dollars. <laughs> And, okay, she earned the money by being a professional reality star. And she's from Kansas. So. Do you call being a reality star being a professional? A professional reality star. So she's a bot woman. And then they just inserted her right into Christianity. And the people went, yep, looks like a Christian to me. And because what? she's cute. <laughs> Because she's cute, she gets away with it. And then she <clears throat> she brings in these other familiar faces. And basically what they're building in this case here is that if we don't all unify uh, no matter what, then you're going to keep people from being saved into our hot mess. And that's going to offend Jesus. <laughs> So she says, uh, right, right. And then Max says, we believed that if it weren't for God's grace, we would have spun out of control by now. You are spun out <laughs> of control. But so your logic is insane because now you're saying that you shouldn't identify what is good and what is evil. You shouldn't identify what needs to have a rescue tossed out to it when it has spun out of control. Um, 
you make no sense. And then she says, totally doesn't even make sense. That is so insane. Paul wanted us to understand that we were not ultimately saved so that we could just sin. And that word ultimate, I think, is an important word because by the time you get to glorification, and your sanctification can be a very long, 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 long and arduous walk. Well, this is until the day we die. But at the end of that walk, when you get to glorification, it's really important to understand that he gifts you sinlessness. Doesn't Paul say that because of grace, does that mean we're allowed to continue in sin? No, God forbid. Didn't Paul say that? Right, and that's exactly the scripture that I was thinking of. I think, I I believe that it's somewhere around Romans, uh, I'm thinking seven, it could be in six, but anyhow, it's somewhere in six, seven. And that word ultimately, I really think you have to put that into your understanding because then there's another group of people that they treat sanctification as if it's all or nothing. And some people actually believe that right now they're sinless. And that's not true. But that's why God has the three-step plan of justification by what he did for you. Then sanctification. And it's a gajillion choices for as long as it takes until he implements glorification. And then at glorification, when you get your body of redemption, when he gifts you your eternal life and you get your new body, your eternal body, which is all talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, just exactly like Jesus got a new eternal body. See, God has saved you ultimately from sin, but you have Max going the other weird direction where he almost like embraces sin. Like, so God came and died for you, but that wasn't so that you could just go sin your little heart's content, you know? Out or whatever, however you want to say that. Right. And so there there is a disconnect here by a pastor that is the size of Texas, and it's very scary. Pastor is the size of Texas? No, his error. So, Max, so we are all people, we of all people should be humble, walking humbly through the world and not casting stones. What? And so I think we could do a little bit better. So this is all just about crunching down on the Bible, crunching down on Jesus. Jesus, you stop telling the world about sin and evil and your plan to cut here because you're 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 not part of fostering this unity. Jesus and his wife, who they're one. Uh, Then Jen says, I agree. And Max says, but I'm hopeful that we will. I mean, these people are such agents of Rome. I, I can't even tell you. Well, it's a Laodicea world. It's the people's rights. Um, they I have, have the right <clears throat> to do whatever they want. But they have the right to slide backslidden into hell if they choose. So he talks about, he promotes a social gospel uh, through here. He just really doesn't align himself with the same goals as Jesus does about this ultimate glorification coming and this ultimate sinlessness. And there is a Bema that we're going to be going to. So it's efficacious for you to cooperate as much as possible uh, with Jesus. So I'm seeing if there's anything else in here that I want to show you. These people are expert level deceptionists. Um, So they're talking about the gospel here. And, And Jen says, yeah, you know, like that's the main core thing. But again, not not a word that I've seen anywhere here about repentance at all. And then Max says, and that has simplified my faith, Jen, for so many years because it has enabled me to have legitimate 
have differences. What? She says, yeah. And then Max says, with people with whom I have great respect. I'm sorry. I don't respect baby killers. I don't. And there's nothing in scripture that says I must forage this, this great level of respect for people that make money off of and promote uh, killing innocent little babies that didn't do anything to you. I don't respect that. I'm supposed to respect murderers? No. And then Max says, and land in two different spots on very difficult issues, but still find ample room for fellowship, love, and respect. There is no fellowship. There is no fellowship with unbelievers. And people are like completely confused about this issue of unbelievers that pretend to be the church. It's almost like they walk around with this banner around and that says, I'm the church. I'm above reproach. You can't tell me anything. I'm the church. And you're like covered in baby blood. You're not the church. And so they want to legitimize this. This is insane. And I think what we tend to do, Max says, is we each <laughs> create our own list of essentials. That list gets longer and longer and longer and longer. Hmm, let's see. Killing babies. That's on the list. <laughs> do you know why that's on the list? Because Jesus said he didn't like it. So stop it. He came and died for you so that you would stop killing things, uh, specifically humans, specifically babies. Stop that. That's disgusting. And you shouldn't profit from that. But see, Max and Jen are multimillionaires, so they, they don't care about the same things that actual Christians care about. They just care about being change agents. And reading the script, memorizing the script, delivering the script. That's exactly what's going on. And uh, here he, he, see, he has no regard for the things that Jesus holds near and dear. None. He says that we create our own list of essentials. Isn't God the one that's creating a list of essentials that we need to pay attention to? And didn't he have the apostles clearly identify those things for us? But see, again, no Bible is open. No scripture is being looked at because you're just seeing the thoughts and words and ideas of man. There is no Bible in this. This is a joke. And Max says, and, and I get that list, <coughs> it gets so long that we look up and we say, nobody shares my list. Nobody shares my list. Oh, my word. This guy's full bore heretic. Like you have to, I mean, do whatever you want. I don't tell people what to do, but um, it would be efficacious for you to understand that this guy is as satanic as they come and they have uh, done the same thing with him that they did with <laughs> Billy Graham back in the day. People can't even handle this because they've been so brainwashed. To believe, no, Billy, Billy was a good guy. No, he was a Mason and he started out with a great gospel and then he augmented it. He had all these dealings with the government, right? It was never about rebirth. And then by the end of it, he has this weird thing that doesn't look like the gospel that I could never have my children listen to because it wasn't the gospel. And then he died. So there is a level of programming and seeding you with garbage that is insane. So then this interview just gets weirder. Um, because these people, I'm telling you, these people are social engineers within the church as Masons trying to pollute the church from within. I'm telling you, he's, then he says the weirdest thing ever. This is really shocking. And you have to remember, they have billed... <coughs> Max Lucado as this very like homebred, wholesome, long-term good guy pastor. Max Lucado, he's a good guy. And then he says this. Uh, so Jen answers to him totally because they've been talking about how 
Uh, Max's list gets so long and we look up and we say, nobody shares my list. So that's completely untrue. You have the entire scripture warning you and telling you that there is one body, one spirit, one faith, one baptism, and uh, many members within that institution, within that new creation of Christ, Christ is the head and you are one. And then he prayed for us for unity for the true born again church in John 17. So none of that scripture comes into play because they don't care about scripture. So uh, she says, totally. And then Max says, right. And this is where it gets really weird. When it should be the opposite, I think. I think I can find fellowship <laughs> with Richard Roar, right? What? Did you just do something that you shouldn't have? And I'll keep that comment to myself. Um, are you drunk? What is your problem? Richard Rohr? Do you know who Richard Rohr is? Wow. Yeah. And she did an interview with him. <laughs> Wow, that's, <laughs> this is hard to take. This is really hard to take. Well, that's Richard. Oh, let me move this out of the way so it's not irritating. Oh, my. Okay, I have to brace myself here for a second because this is, oh, this is a lot to take. This is like being punched in the face, spiritually. Um. So, okay, let's back it up here. Back it up, back it up, back it up. So if you haven't figured out by the uh, attire, he's a Roman Catholic. It says here, so this is the show she does with him. For the Love of Faith Groundbreakers, episode five. We're over here at jenhatmaker.com. <laughs> episode five, live yourself into a new way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Richard Rohr. Father Richard Rohr. Now, doesn't the Bible say not to call any man father and not to call any man uh, rabbi? And it's talking not so much about the title per se, I don't think, but more about do. And then God goes on to say that he is your father and he is your rabbi. And, and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. So this is talking about not just taking anybody as your spiritual authority, but Christ and his spirit. Oh, boy. OK, ready? Ready? Let's keep going. So I think God is telling you very clearly to be careful in the future when there will be the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope and all of these people that say that they're your authority as father. And God's saying they're not your authority is what he's saying. And then also. Uh, dollars to donuts. I, I think that Pope Francis is that false prophet of scripture. Um, his resume seems to be very, very lock and step with the false prophet of the Bible and this coexisting. But then also real quick, the, uh, the rabbi thing. Well, remember you have a fake Jesus, a fake rabbi coming and God is telling you, he's not your authority either. I am, but back to Richard Rohr, who Max Licato is on par with. And let's find out what Richard believes. Would you like to? <laughs> so Father Richard Rohr is one of our best teachers, hands down. So this woman does nothing but use vain flattery. And look at what Proverbs says about vain flattery. Watch out. You're being manipulated. And he's being manipulated. And they're all manipulating together in unison. It's so precious like evil, hands down. And whether it's through his work at the center of action and contemplation, remember, so they're always about this mystical, you know, meditation, this, you know, close your mind down, um, have these spiritual experiences, yoke with Brahma of Hinduism, yoke with the force. You've got all these churches that are bringing Star Wars into the pulpit and into the, the kids's frame of reference for the force and all that stuff. That's straight from the pit of hell. 
so contemplation from the Desert Fathers, these these Catholic uh, Desert Fathers that uh, they they want you to have these experiences with counterfeit spirits. That's not the holy that are not the Holy Spirit. In other words, which he founded in Albuquerque, New Mexico, or the many enlightening books he's written. They're so enlightening. That's New Age. Father Richard is dedicated to helping people realize their best selves. On your way to hell, you can have your best life now and you can have your best self now. Um, I was starting to say before that it almost feels to me like we're exchanging the great treasures that could be had in this life through capitulating to the devil and how he wants to give us this and give us that. And it almost feels like the true born again Christian is saying no to those things. And I know this is talked about in the book of Hebrews because um, <clears throat> Moses has talked about how he turned down the riches <coughs> of Pharaoh's uh, earthly kingdom and he left and he went into the wilderness. And of course, God used him. And now he is waiting for this coming rest, this rest. And this uh, New Jerusalem, and, a, and 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 then it's said in a really interesting way that the writer of Hebrews talks about how he he gave up those things, and he was he was waiting patiently for God, basically, uh, for this city that was built without human hands, this New Jerusalem, and you see this beautiful environment for for the uh, the children of God. So it almost feels to me like if you're a true legit born again Christian, you're maybe not going to be having access to the rich treasures of this world you're you're being crucified to self and that probably has a, a lot of connotations a lot of meanings to it but I'm, I'm i'm saying that just for this one particular thing and it seems like in the life to come is the opportunity for the riches and whatnot when you have chosen the treasure so you know that's something to consider but anyhow he he wants you to have your best self inwardly and outwardly what does that mean because remember they these people don't believe that you're a sinner in need of change but you know they'll they'll glom on to the grace you know have your little buffet take whatever religious stuff you want and throw in some grace too and at the end of it it just bastardizes the sacrifice of what jesus did and how we have to repent and get born again but anyhow back to the article a champion for look, social justice, which is another gospel, who spent decades fighting for equality, he shows us a way to radical compassion by gently leading us to see the world with new eyes through the concept of voluntary displacement, i.e. when we willing, uh, willfully move out of our comfort zones and live ourselves into new ways of thinking. So just accept evil. Because this is going to make these people more money. They love them money. Okay. <clears throat> they love themselves the more money. For such a wise and contemplative guy. This cool factor is off the charts. So this woman has to talk like a 12 year old. He calls Bono a good friend. And he was considered the foremost expert. <laughs> on the Enneagram way before it was the hot topic of the day. If your church brings that nonsense in, run. Jen and Father Richard discussed the changers. <laughs> what? This is so weird. <coughs> of individualistic Christianity. <gasps> in the context of his new book, The Universal Christ. And how so many of us have a stingy view of God who doles out his love to just a certain few. Oh, my word. Oh, wow. This is so evil and heretical. So, see, this is all about the collective from Rome. This is all about the um, bringing the masses underneath this coming cosmic Christ. This, this is evil. This is evil. Oh, and it's not that God doles his love out to a certain few. It's rather that a, a certain few accept God's love. That's the problem. 
He sums up our spiritual challenges in one masterful concept that, if we truly embraced, it would change the direction of our lives. And then, wow, they they pepper in a scripture, and they don't even say where that is in scripture. Nothing can separate us from God except the thought that, oh, that's not scripture. I'm sorry. I thought they were actually going to use scripture. No, they use a aberration of uh, the, this part right here. Nothing can separate us from God. So that's in Romans 8. But then he says, except the thought that we're separate from God. You can't be saved unless you acknowledge that you're separate from God. You wouldn't be doing evil if you had God inside your temple. That's what happened in the garden. Not only did God leave the environment of Eden and temporarily, potentially, divorced Adam and Eve, Goresh, when he drove them out of the garden, it's that word Goresh. It means divorce. But it also is the response that God left their temples. Remember, God's word says that the, the, these temples in Israel were not for the purpose of God staying inhabited in them. Why? Because he wanted to be in mankind. But remember, through rebirth. Now, rebirth is what happens as the, the fix. When Adam and Eve were originally made, the Holy Spirit was inside of them until they sinned, and then he exited, he left. Now, <clears throat> we do things in keeping with Satan and the rebellion. That's why we sin. And then he gave us the Ten Commands so that we, if we ask, what sin? He'd go, here's an objective standard. And then he came down and he lived and he kept the objective standard, right? And he gives us means to pay for our sins on the cross when we repent and when we trust through his grace, through our faith, that what he did on the cross, death, burial, resurrection, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, that that was enough to connect us back with God. So if you're saying that you're not separate from God, you're not even taking the Christian um, understanding to be yoked in with God. So this guy just has a thing against Christianity, where you are in a, a personal relationship with God through this covenant. It's a marriage thing. You know, read about the ancient Jewish wedding. It's a marriage thing. Betrothal. <clears throat> and uh, I want to I want to see what's up with this book of his. That is just a month. So this is New Age inseminating itself into a fake form of Christianity. Do, do you understand? That's not Christianity. Richard Rohr is about, um, ooh, is about changing the faith. This is like a female Madame Blavatsky. This is a, a male version of the female Madame Blavatsky, I mean to say, excuse me. This is about um, Alice Bailey and um, that whole doctrines of demons. These are doctrines of demons. This is what Christ warned that that they will say that the the Christ is there in the desert and in your inner chambers. Universal Christ, that your Christ, we're all one together and we're Christ, we're God. Um Wow, this is evil. And Max Lucado wants to be one with them because they're changing Christianity. It's brand new, too. It just came out this year in spring. Okay, let me see here. Of course, the New York Times uh, picked him up for a bestseller for one of the world's most influential spiritual thinkers. A long-awaited book exploring what it means that Jesus was called Christ. Um, it means he was anointed. Do you know what that means? So he's called the last Adam. And you know what Christ means? Anointed. Do you know who he's anointed with? The Holy Spirit. So wait, you mean to say that the first Adam had the Holy Spirit, as did Eve, that came from Adam? Uh-huh. And then you mean that when they sinned, God divorced them, left their body, and left the environment where heaven and earth had kissed together in Eden? Uh-huh. And then you mean to say that at the proper time, like Hebrews says, 
that God, the son of God, God omnipotent came down into the flesh of the son of man, son of God called the last Adam. And he was full of the Holy Spirit. And then he did things that were perfect according to the will of God. And he told Satan, no. And then he offered us the right to become the sons of God, which is the opposite of slave. Uh Uh-huh. So I'm willing to bet you dollars to donuts here that this Jesuit, Masonic, fake Christian, Roman Catholic guy that these other new age Christian leaders, worthless shepherds, Zachariah 11, um, it's probably going to say that we're gods and that we're all one and connected. And that's, you know, kind of why you have all this, you know, hyper unity stuff, unity, unity, unity. It's so that they can say that they're all one together in this cosmic Christ. This is just your basic new age. This is what Bethel is about. Bethel has been one of the best pro, um, um, <coughs> providers of this type of weird, new age Christian nonsense. And Jen is part of Bethel. I mean, this is, this is as evil as it gets. So yes, we know that Christ was not Jesus's last name. They went by, you know, son of so-and-so son of so-and-so we have genealogies and everything. Um, Oh, wow. This is not cool. So, I mean, these people are on their way to hell. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just the straight out truth. Drawing on scripture, put that in quotes, history and spiritual practice, the Roman Catholic war articulates a transformative view of Jesus Christ as a portrait of God's constant unfolding work in the world. Okay. And then he says, God loves things by becoming them. <laughs> That doesn't make sense. He writes, and Jesus' life was meant to declare that humanity has never been separate from God. You big giant liar. We wouldn't need to be born again if we were one with God. But the very fact that we sin shows that we are not in accord with God. God is not in us and God is not getting his way by having us um, image copy him. Image has to do with copying. It has to do like when you make those little, um, you know, baby rattle uh, candies or whatever, you know, you have a mold and you have your chocolate and you're going to have a party for your friend that's that's pregnant or whatever, for example, and you pour the, the chocolate into the mold, you're expecting to get the same image out of your piece of chocolate that you pour into that mold as the mold. God is the mold. And he, when he created Adam and Eve, it was kind of like in this, in this metaphor that I'm giving you this picture, he was pouring a mold tit for tat the same, but he offered choice. And Adam and Eve said, no, thank you to God. And God left the inside of their temple. That makes sense because when God comes is the exact image of God. It's said in, in Colossians, read Colossians. It's said in other places too, but the the other scriptures slipped my mind at the second, but you can uh, just Google Jesus Christ, the the exact image of God, because it's talked about in at least two scriptures. It might even be more than that, but this is the thing. And then Jesus also said in John, it was like, I don't know, John six, somewhere around there. He was talking about, I only do the thing. It might've been John eight even. Uh, I only do the things that I hear my father say, you know, everything that he did was lock and step with good in accord with God, right? He's image copying God. So obviously we're not united with God when we do evil. And that's pretty obvious to see that we say evil, think evil, do evil. And we know what evil is by the 10 commands. This guy is just lying to you. So uh, it says here, except by its own negative choice. Well, that doesn't even make sense about being separate from God, except by its own negative choice. That is what has been put onto all of humanity. And that's why you have the 6,000 years worth of evil. When we recover this fundamental truth. Oh, you mean from, from the serpent saying that we were, we can be like God <clears throat> in the garden that caused all this problem. Uh, faith becomes less about proving Jesus was God 
and more about learning to recognize the creator's presence all around us. And oh my, here you go. In everyone we meet. <laughs> this is exactly what new age teaches. This is exactly what Kanye West means when he says that God is, is everywhere. He's not talking about God being omnipotent and omnipresent and all that within the biblical model. He's saying that God is in everything, right? That's what he's saying. This is what new age teaches. They're saying that God is in the uh, abortion doctor who's carving that baby up. God's inside you and you're doing what God wants you to do. And you have people that are actually teaching that. <clears throat> wow. And the New York, um, New York Times bestseller list said, yep, this is good. The people gave it almost five stars. Yeah, we, 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 Babylon, the anti-bride, the, the world in rebellion, the whore church that worships ourselves, worships Satan, worships each other, worships all the false gods. We are taking over and you, whoa, and we're God. <laughs> that is insane. That is so bad. And you have um, Ron Carpenter over at the Potter's house also saying that well, Christ the man went up to heaven and he left Christ the body down here on earth. That's exactly what he said. Wow. Thought-provoking, practical. It's practical. Yeah, you are God, Bubby. <laughs> That's practical. And full of deep hope and vision, the Universal Christ is a landmark book from one of our <laughs> most beloved spiritual writers and an invitation to contemplate how God liberates and loves all that is. <laughs> My goodness. Wow. Oh my, oh my goodness. And then of course you have all these, all these evil people that just join in. Look at this one. The Reformed Church in America, Wesley Gramberg Michelson, General Secretary Emeritus. Oh, I bet he gets a big fat paycheck of the Reformed Church in America. Anyone who has made a confession of faith and Jesus Christ should read this book to grasp more fully the vast and startling implications of this belief. This is new age repackaged again. This is Richard Rohr at his best providing an overall summation. Oh, my word of his theological insights that have been life changing for so many. This is straight out from the pit of hell. Wow, a major shift in our culture is needed and Richard Rohr's unpacking the universal Christ is a critical step in the right direction. Remembering our connection to everything has implications for our religious traditions, society. Wow. And dare I say it, even politics. Well, I mean, yeah, that makes sense in light of the fact that a fake Jesus is coming to take over the earth and his fake bride is going to be like, I'm God, just like the children of Eve who displays a remarkable lack of concern and loyalty for God, but God did forgive Adam and Eve. Um, but their children are at the soon coming tail end of this insanity are going to get it. And God, even then says, come, come out from among her, come out of this rebellion, this huge rebellion. This is so bad. And then Melinda Gates, author of The Moment of Life, is would that be Bill's? Uh, not Bill. Um, yeah, Bill Gates. Is that Bill Gates' wife, Melinda? Father Richard challenges us to search beneath the surface of our faith uh -huh, and see what is sa oh, sacred in everyone and everything. No, no, I'm not going to sign on to that and say that everything is God. That is what Romans 1 says. You gonna get it. You gonna get it because you worship the creation more than the creator who is to be forever treasured. And in all of this insanity, you have Max Lucado 
saying that he could yoke with Richard Rohr. Wow. Do you, do you see now with clear eyes what you have surrounding you? Video after video. I was going to do a short video, but it's <sighs> anyone who strives to put their faith into action will find encouragement and inspiration in the pages of this book. Melinda Gates, uh, the moment of lift. And I bet you anyhow, that is uh, one billionaires speaking about, uh, I wonder how much money he has. See, I would well imagine that he's a millionaire as well. Um, so we'll look, we'll look into that <laughs> in a moment. We're going to wrap this up here too in a minute. Rory sees Christ everywhere. <laughs> this is so demonic. This is not normal. Not just in people he reminds us of. This. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so bad. And the first incarnation of God in its creation itself. Oh, and he tells us that God loves things by becoming them. Jaden, does God love things by becoming them? <laughs> Am I right? You're you're you don't believe that you're God, Jaden? Are you are you God, Jaden? No. Is Kissy God? No. Jesus, are you sure? Yes, Jesus is God. Okay. Well, so you're right, and these wing nuts are wrong. Is there a price to pay for saying that you're God when God is yes. God? Yeah. By the way, Kissy is our cute little uh American long haired cat who I'm who I'm having a okay. very bad okay. Thank time you. Thank trying you. Trying to get an eye okay. booger out of. Him. Leave his eye boogers alone. Just leave him alone. So anyhow, that's what you have here: the professional PR marketing firm of celebrities and well-known people that are saying, "Yep, this sounds you like the truth." If Harvey, ask if uh, asked if Harvey is God, and I would definitely say no. No, because if Harvey yeah. is our other uh, tabby cat, American. Law. Uh, short hair tabby cat. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this is so bad. So Bono continues saying that just for that sentence, there are so many more. I cannot put this book down. Well, why wouldn't millionaire Bono, who doesn't give a rip about Jesus Christ, why wouldn't he agree that he's God? And remember, this fits in with the transhumanism goal, and this fits in with the Catholic Church and this conference they did in the summer of 2019, where they got all these people together to forge this idea that it is the will of God, it is the will of man, it's which is the same thing, to um, step into transhumanism, to use this technology as your salvation. And Babylon is going to worship Babylon and worship the Antichrist and worship the abomination of desolation and these are the people that are push, push, pushing you forward. So it doesn't really surprise me having this new age nonsense coming from him because I already knew about who and what he is as a major change agent. And they all want you to meditate. They all want you to get into yoga and meditate and uh, just get it all ready for the devil, you know, just get it all ready. But what does surprise me, I suppose, in some way, is <clears throat> that Max Lucado can find fellowship with Richard Rohr. Because you know what? They both believe they're gods. <laughs> when but you know they're not gods. Exactly. So we should um, try to wrap this up. Jen says, sure, but to your point, when that is what our faith is organized around, so fellowship with others is what their faith is about, okay, not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, no, no, unity, because remember, the end goal is to get you into transhumanism, get you worshiping yourself, all the fake gods, Satan, uh, the Antichrist who comes and deceives the whole world, Satan gives him power, the, the um, figurehead of the false prophets. Uh, and all, this whole big, huge rebellion so that you all worship the creation and not the creator. And then you get it. That's This is where it's going. This is what they want. This is what makes them happy. This is how they can pollute Christ's bride. But this is the fake. This is the fake, right? So if you're a real true born again Christian, you're going to know that don't sound right. I'm just letting you know that your leaders are leading you into evil. And the fake Christians don't 
don't even know that this is evil. This is shocking. <clears throat> that's the core of it. She says, that's it. That's the good news of it. That's the truth of it. And it's not that the things in the second and third and fourth tier don't matter because they do matter. They're worthy of our attention and our discussion. Our robust, even debates, sometimes around it for the sake of the good of the world and faith, faithfulness. But that's at the middle and that's enough to hold. And I have found that to be profoundly true in my life too. That's when you say a whole lot without saying anything at all. And, and then they almost kind of give like this, speaking out of the other side of the mouth, like there's other things that we can debate about it after she's had this whole dialogue with him that your differences don't matter. Unite on the things you agree with and whatever you don't agree with doesn't matter. And she brings in to talk out of the other side of her mouth and says, but there are things that we can talk about. This, this is just a crazy comment. <laughs> I can find <coughs> fellowship with Richard Rohr, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, of course. Even though we come from two entirely different worlds. Well, then what was the deal with Paul saying to not yoke with unbelievers? What's up with that? So these people aren't even obeying what the Bible says. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? That's like first Corinthians, oh, second Corinthians 614. So as long as they do what they want to do, that's all they care about. They don't care what the Holy Spirit said through Paul who's actually their authority and Jesus. <coughs> what harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Hmm, they don't care. They're all going to be making a lot of money. According to North or NetworthPost.org, he is worth $19 million. Yeah. He's making a comeback. <clears throat> the more that I read Roar's work and watched his videos and interviews, the more I wanted to scream out a warning to the sheep about this wolf, Roar's new age, cobbledy book, heresy, apostasy, psychobabble is just so bad. It barely pretends to be Christian, but then Roar pretty much admits the pretense. <laughs> And he's been up to this for decades. For so many years now, I thought he had faded away <clears throat> to where old dissident clergy go, such as bishops, all these people. If you thought the Lavender Mafia in the church is a new thing, you weren't reading The Wanderer in the 1990s pre-internet. I don't know what they're talking about. <clears throat> but Roar is still on the scene. He's been re rehabilitated for at least reintroduced to a new generation of Catholics, this is written by a Catholic, who were babies or not yet born when his shenanigans were documented along with the rest of the gang just mentioned. Why do I think they're not going to care ultimately? I could be wrong, though. Let's keep reading. I was just skimming it. In the course of writing this post and encountering Roar's literal nonsense, I went from calm to indignant to outraged that he is now influencing the next generation. It's hard to grasp that his latest book is ranked number one at the time of this writing. <clears throat> so it's called Christian Meditation, Worship, and Devotion and Christology. Roar's false New Age teachings expose souls to much spiritual danger. And you will hear my ask, ex exasperation reflected in my tone. So be it, Lord, have mercy on us. That's interesting that this Catholic is saying that this Catholic is a problem. Um, 
He's got shelves of Buddhist, Hindu, Christian books and figures. Oh, wow. So, yeah, he worships the god of everything. I'm skipping through this article because there's some prints I really don't want to <laughs> put on here. But I will put a copy of this article on here. <clears throat> when you have Max Lucado saying that he can yoke with this, we're talking about the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst. And I get what they mean about Lavender Mafia now because I say Rainbow Mop Mafia. He's into all kinds of weirdness. He uh, denies hell like they all do. <laughs> Ford teaches that Jesus the man is something separate from Christ, a.k.a. the cosmic Christ. I mean, this is this is just new age is all it is. Parading around is Catholicism, parading around as if it's yoked with the true church. It's not. We discovered in his talks that the universal Christ is another name for everything. Everything. Yeah. There's no way I can really describe what kind of nonsense there is here. Read it for yourself. So she's annoyed, but um, Layla herself needs to be born again. And we will we will end with this paragraph then. Well, this paragraph. A universal notion of Christ takes mysticism beyond the mere individual and private level that has been seen as mysticism's weakness. Okay. Well, because there's lots of people that aren't going to meditate and do yoga and do all this weird stuff where you put your mind in neutral and experience these uh, false spirit experiences and whatever. Hi, kitty. <clears throat> if authentic God experience overcomes the primary false split between yourself and the divine, then it should also overcome the equally false split between yourself and the rest of creation. This is this is a doctrine of devils that the Bible told us would come. And this man makes $19 million at, at, at that time, whenever the writing of that was, to deliver them to you. And Max Lucado's like, yep, sounds like the truth to me. For some of us, the first split is overcome personally in an experience of Jesus, but for many others, maybe even most, union with the divine is first experienced through the Christ. Wow. In nature, in moments of pure love, silence, inner, outer music with animals, okay, all before beauty or some kind of brother, son, and sister moon experience. This is weird. Why? Because creation is... <laughs> Itself is the first incarnation of Christ. This is so evil. The primary and foundational Bible that reveals the path to God. No. The first incarnation of the Christ mystery started about, oh brother, nearly 14 billion years ago at the Big Bang. Uh, no. Christ said, let there be, and it was. And we're going according to a 7,000 year timetable. <clears throat> So that start with Jesus. So some start with Jesus, but many who begin with the Christ mystery did not have that experience validated by the church because it's heresy from the devil. They look secular, humanistic, or like mere nature mystics. Oh my goodness. Oh, that mean old church. You're not telling people they're gods, you mean church. She says, folks, that's not satire. That's actually the way this priest writes and talks and believes, and it is no basis. There is no basis whatsoever in Christianity. Run, don't walk away from this nothingness disguised as enlightenment. I mean, true. I don't know how long this article is, but this, <laughs> this. Okay, so this this is a warning from, from her. That's fine. She needs to get born again, though, too. But anyhow, this is who uh, Max Lucado says that he wants to have fellowship with. Yeah. So anyhow, thank you if you lasted the whole amount of time with me. I really appreciate it. I didn't anticipate it was going to be this long, but as you dig and search, whoo, boy, are my eyes opened. This is so wicked. Anyhow, <clears throat> I think I'm going to go with what the Bible said right here to not be an equally yoked with unbelievers because God's word and the Holy Spirit foresaw what would be coming 
and how everybody would be yoking together in error and that we weren't to be a part of that. My goodness. Thank you. Bye.